an influx of unaccompanied children at the border creates a crisis. The overwhelming number of kids um, was really just incredibly sad, um, and it really speaks to the fact that um, this country is in desperate need of uh, comprehensive immigration reform. What now for thousands of children in Nogales and other detention centers? Even reunification with a family member doesn't get them any kind of legal status. It may get them released during the time that their case is pending, while other children may have to fight their entire case while detained. But ultimately, it doesn't lead to any kind of status. This is Arizona Week. Welcome to Arizona Week. I'm Christopher Conover. Lorraine Rivera is on assignment. This week, the immigration debate has turned to Nogales and the Texas border, where a spike in the number of unaccompanied children trying to illegally cross the border has created what President Obama calls a humanitarian crisis. Reporter Fernanda Echavarri is covering the story and brings us this report. About 1,000 children and teens are in a Border Patrol holding facility in Nogales after being apprehended crossing into the United States illegally. The kids crossed without adults through the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, what has become the busiest corridor for illegal immigration in the country. They were flown to Arizona because facilities in Texas could not handle the influx. Jose Joaquin Chacon, the consul from El Salvador in Tucson, says some of the migrants detained are as young as three years old. Most of them are in their early teens. Bueno, las condiciones indiscutiblemente no pueden ser las más óptimas, las mejores, pero sí están ya mejorando calidad de comida, inclusive eh, facilidades para que puedan asearse, tomar baño, cambiarse de ropa, etc. The Border Patrol compound in Nogales is serving as temporary housing for the kids, where they can be processed by immigration officials and talk to representatives from their home countries who try to contact family members in the U.S. or in Central America. Migración está buscando ya eh, shelter o albergues para que allí los trabajadores o trabajadoras sociales están ya haciendo el proceso de reunificación. The White House is calling the spike in children crossing the border alone an urgent humanitarian crisis. The issue is not new, however. For more than a decade, Border Patrol has apprehended thousands of teens crossing without parents. Senior White House officials say three factors are making this such a phenomenon right now a 90% increase in kids crossing alone from last year, a large number of girls found in the groups, and an age average dropping below 13 years old. President Barack Obama directed the Department of Homeland Security to form a multi-agency group to better handle the situation. The Federal Emergency Management Agency is taking the lead providing for the kids. Not many people, including reporters, have been allowed to go inside the Nogales holding facility. State Representative Damian Klinko says after multiple tries, he and other state lawmakers were given a restricted tour Sunday. There were multiple federal agencies there, including FEMA and, some, and a health organization. Um, they were, while we were there, they were um, finalizing the installation of portable shower systems. Um, and we're going to make sure that that area was secure. Um, they were going to be installing temporary washing machines. They were, when we were there, they were having lunch, so they were moving these kids through the system um, and through the facility to actually sit down and have, um, have a meal. Um, they were eating burritos and uh, apples, water and milk. Um, but it, the overwhelming number of kids um, was really just incredibly sad. Um, and it really speaks to the fact that um, this country is in desperate need of uh, comprehensive immigration reform. Federal officials have, for years, required that kids in immigration detention are turned over to Health and Human Services within 72 hours of being apprehended. The government is not meeting that requirement with the children in the Nogales compound. Klinko says based on what he saw during his tour of the shelter, the government is treating this as a humanitarian emergency instead of a border security issue. Although it's a detention center, it didn't have a sense of, um, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a climate of hostility or of any sort of prison environment. I mean, it really was, you know, trying to work within the confines of a, of a facility that was large enough uh, to accommodate these kids. 
There is not one specific factor that is causing the increase in migration. Humanitarian advocates, government officials and immigration experts attribute the influx to the increase in violence in the kids' home countries, especially in Honduras, where the number of minors crossing has increased by a tenfold. The lack of economic opportunities and a desire to reunite with parents who have migrated to the U.S. are also playing a big role. Guatemalan government officials say there is also misinformation about immigration reform and what could be considered free passes for Central American children because they are not deported right away. Uh, the smugglers come with the children to Sonora. They, in, at the border, they say to the kids, uh, you have to walk to that point, and in that point is going to come the border patrol for you. So the, border, so the kids wait to the border patrol, the border patrol taken, and uh, began all the procedure. A Senate appropriations panel has approved giving the Obama administration the $2 billion it requested to handle the influx. Although U.S. government officials would not comment on the opening of a new emergency shelter in Tucson, the consul from Guatemala says Tucson will likely have a shelter by the end of the month. Joining us now in the studio is Fernanda Echavarri, a reporter with Arizona Public Media. Fernanda, thanks for sitting down with us. Thanks for having me. We just watched your package. You last weekend were in Nogales as the, the first group of children were arriving at that detention center. To be clear, these are not Mexican children that have been picked up. They're from other countries, correct? Correct. The majority of the kids that are in the facility at Nogales are from three main countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. And uh, to give you more of a breakdown, there's about a thousand kids, just a little over a thousand. Um, about 350 are from the three countries, each from the three countries I just mentioned. Then we have about seven from Ecuador, four from Nicaragua, one from Peru, and six from India. Those are the, the numbers that we got from the consul from Guatemala earlier this week. Um, the Mexican kids are treated differently when they are picked up by Border Patrol. They're not put in detention centers long term like the, like the teens and children from Central American countries or other than Mexicans as actually Border Patrol. Uh, classifies them. And just to also give you an idea of how many kids are in Arizona in general, there's about 1,600 other uh, Central American minors who are in about eight shelters throughout Arizona. Most of them are in Phoenix that have been there for, for even before this sort of influx of kids from Texas arrived. You bring up these other kids. Earlier this week, the ACLU and some other groups filed a complaint, a civil rights complaint, surrounding uh, the way some of these kids are being treated in these detention facilities and centers. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Explain what's going on. Well, it, it's really important to notice that the complaint that was filed, there were interviews with over 100 kids and teens from 5 to about 17 years old from different countries, and they all have been arrested and apprehended by Border Patrol. These, this all happened before the influx that we saw from Texas. So it's, it's fair to even assume that a lot of the kids that we're hearing about in Arizona cross through Arizona. So this is, a, this is different from, from this huge influx that we're seeing coming in in Texas in the recent months. Um, this issue of unaccompanied minors crossing the border has been going on for more than a decade. Every single year, uh, uh, the U.S. government actually prepares for an increase because it's been happening. The government was not ready for an increase of more than 90 percent. So, so, so the, what, the, what the civil rights organizations are saying is that the conditions in which the kids have been uh, detained for 72 hours or more by Border Patrol in the last few months or even a year uh, are inhumane and unlawful. They complain about abuse, physical abuse. There's even allegations of uh, sexual misconduct from some of the agents. Let's move forward a little bit. This uh, spike that everybody is talking about has become part of the immigration reform debate. This week we had various Republicans saying that the immigration reform can't go forward and this is the reason why the, the border is not secure. Here's the proof. At the same time, uh, House Majority Leader Eric Cantor lost uh, a political race. He will not be back. It looks like immigration reform may not now happen in Congress. What are you hearing from Democrats about the possibility of immigration reform? So it's actually the complete opposite. While people like John McCain and Jeff Flake are saying we need to secure our borders and so is our governor Jan Brewer says this is, this is a, a complete 
um, this is a show of how much border security we need. Um, people like Ra uh, Congressman Raul Grijalva, uh, State Representative Damian Klinko, whose district covers the Nogales Detention Center, are saying the opposite, that this is, this is a cry for immigration reform, that, that if immigration reform does not pass, this influx will continue and that we need immigration reform. So you're, we're seeing it from both sides, people who want more border security and are using this as an example of how the federal government is not handling immigration properly and others who say we need immigration reform to address this. You've talked to White House officials a couple of times this week. What are they saying about what's going to hap be happening going forward? Very little, actually. We have um, we hear about sort of more of the immediate reaction to the issue at hand, which is this thousands of kids. And the Obama administration was given the two billion dollars it asked for to deal with the situation, to bring in FEMA to handle emergency shelters for these kids. But there's not really a plan that's been laid out that is going to address immigration and this issue in the long term. All right, Fernanda Chavari, thank you so much for uh, coming in and talking with us. I'm sure we'll hear more from you in the coming weeks. Thank you for having me. Joining me now is Art Del Cueto, head of the union that represents Border Patrol agents in southern Arizona. Thanks so much for sitting down with us. Thank you. You've been in the detention facility in Nogales where the, these kids are being kept. Obviously, media is not allowed in. A couple of pictures have leaked out. but. You're our eyes in this case. Describe what it's like inside, what's going on inside. Well, well first off, uh, thank you for having me. I, I, I wanted to get across, I represent the agents. I'm not representing the agency. Um, I'm, I am, like you said, the president of the union. Um, we, I was in there on Tuesday, me and uh, another one of my uh, vice presidents. Um, it's basically a big uh, warehouse, and we have uh, divisions inside it. So um, you have divisions uh, according to age, and gender. So you have uh, the females 15 through 16 and 17 on one area, males uh, 15, 16, and 17 in another area, and then it goes on so on by age group. Uh, there's telephones so that these uh, kids are calling their, their relatives that they have within the United States. There's uh, medical staff there that's taking proper care of them. Uh, they're, uh, they're getting fed at least three times a day. It's, it's it, depending on how you see it, you know, yeah, they're, they're children, but you gotta understand uh, the majority are 15, 16, and 17. They're still kids. I used to work at the prison system, and I can tell you that th this detention facility uh, is, is better off than some of the juvenile detention facilities that I worked for in the state. I can say that. Did you get a chance to talk to any of the, the children, the kids that are in there, <clears throat> uh, about their experience, why they're coming up uh, at this point? Yeah, we, we got a chance. I got to close to several of them. You know, I, I went to uh, the area where the females are being housed and where the males are being housed and I got to talk to, I got a chance to talk to several of them. Uh, they all pretty much had the same story um, that uh, they heard through uh, radio, through family that's already in the United States, uh, through uh, media obviously and through different religious groups that uh, right now was the time to come if you were a minor from Central America and you would get away with not having to go back to your country. And these kids are all generally from Central America. We're not seeing Mexican kids in this detention center. I heard there were actually some kids from India, like six kids from India in there, oddly enough. If it was just six, I mean, there's was, was close to a thousand, so I didn't see those six. But I can tell you that the majority that we spoke to uh, that I saw, it was uh, from El Salvador, Guatemala, and uh, Honduras. Uh, let's talk about th what you said. These kids are hearing they don't have to return. That's what they're hearing uh, in their home countries. Correct. That's not the case, though, correct? That's not what the law is. Well, it's not what the law is, and that's what has some of the agents uh, upset over the situation. We're doing everything we can as far as Border Patrol and processing these individuals here at our, this detention facility. By processing them, I mean you ask them uh, several questions uh, to prove uh, that they are from Central America, some of them are carrying birth certificates, some of them are not, separate IDs. So we do the best we can with these individuals. Um, then uh, once the, that goes through and all the paperwork is done, the medical staff makes sure that they don't have any kind of illness or disease. They're being vaccinated, uh, so they're getting all their vaccines, and then um, they're being turned over to ICE, and then ICE is taking care of uh, the relocation. I know in some instances some of these relocations is... Uh, the, they're being relocated with their family members in the United States and being told that when they get to, to where they're going to uh, report to immigration there. And what are the chances of them actually reporting to immigration? 
that's the issue. How are the kids? What's the demeanor of the kids? Are they happy? Are they sad <laughs> to, to be here? What, what did you see? They're, you know, like it's, it's different ages. So you got some uh, just playing, some were not playing. I saw cards. Some of them were playing cards. Some of them were playing uh, Mexican lottery. Um, you know, they're, they're joking around. Some, some, some of the females, you know, would joke around. Some would be sad. And I mean, it, it's just, it fluctuates. You know, you got different kids there. They've been there for a while. Um, it's, they're regular kids. We've talked a lot over the years uh, in, in the media and across the country that the Tucson sector was kind of the, the last sector of the border that was really being dealt with. Uh, Texas was closed down. California was closed mm -hmm. down. All these kids came through Texas. Did you hear from any of the kids or in talking with other agents why Texas and not through Tucson sector as we've heard so much about? No, no. I, I have a theory, if you, if you don't mind me saying uh, uh, Tucson sector is responsible for 60% of all the drug seizures in the entire country. So uh, the cartels uh, run a lot of that area. Uh, I would, my theory is uh, that, uh, and of course it's just my theory, that uh, since the cartels do run those areas, they prohibit uh, some of the entry of these uh, migrants and uh, they focus more on the drugs that are coming into the country. Was this a change in the role for the Border Patrol opening up this uh, detention facility in Nogales that hadn't been open for a while? More of uh, the president called a humanitarian crisis, dealing with that humanitarian crisis part, or is this just part and parcel of what you do? It's, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, the agents that are there right now, they volunteer to be working in that position, uh, but it affects uh, the rest of us because it makes certain areas more porous. And like I said, you know, Arizona is a... Uh, the top area for drug smuggling. So it makes it more porous for drug smugglers, which is a concern. It also uh, puts the agent's life at risk because you know when you're removing agents from the field, putting them in this processing center, you, your backup is further away. And we have noticed uh, uh, a higher rate of uh, some of these individuals that we apprehend tending to fight more and be more aggressive since this started about two weeks ago. So it, it's, there, there's several concerns um, there uh, with that. Going back inside, when you went in, uh, taking off your, your Border Patrol hat, if you will, and just being a human being, being a dad, being a brother, <clears throat> being a son, what was it like seeing these, these thousand kids inside this facility? Well, I've, I've been doing this for 11 uh, plus years now, going on over 11 years, and you deal with many aspects of the job. Um, you know, it, it is sad. But uh, it, it saddens me more when, when I see these individuals uh, that the cartels and the smugglers that are charging these, these kids uh, thousands of money to bring them in the country uh, through the desert. That saddens me more. Um, what I think is important is the people that are bringing them across, as well as the individuals that are there, uh, they need to face some kind of repercussion. You need, you, need, you need to do something. You can't just give them a free ticket to be here in America. That's... Uh, uh, you, it's, it's the law enforcement side and the humanitarian side. You, you kind of tend to look at both. I know some of the agents that are there, um, some of the stories that probably won't get published is a lot of these agents, they've brought toys, balls, and different you know, stuff from home in order to give to these kids. And those are some of the stories that you don't hear that the agents are actually doing there. You said some of the kids uh, were telling you that they'd been told in their home countries that now is the time to come up here if you're a kid and, and you get kind of a free pass to stay in here. They're escaping violence, many of them, uh, in their home countries. What are they going to face once they're processed here, uh, escaping the violence there? What are they going to face here, do you think? Well, I believe they're, they're first off, obviously, it's going to be the language barrier. Um, I spoke to some 17-year-olds, and they, they said, uh, you know, we're just waiting. We, we heard that we're going to get released soon and uh, we're on our way to New York and I have uh, family in New York, I already have a job waiting for me. So, you know, who knows what they're facing. I think uh, as a country we're facing something and we should be more aware of it. We did an amnesty in 86 for individuals that were here illegally. Uh, there was uh, some type of uh, arrangement, also immigration arrangement in the 90s for people that were here. Now you hear everyone talking about amnesty now, that it needs to be done. Now you have these individuals that are coming, they're minors, and uh, potentially they're gonna be released in the United States and they're not gonna ever go back. So what do we have? We're gonna have another amnesty in 15 years from now. So where does it end? You know, at some point somebody has to take responsibility. 
I know the consulate of uh, Salvador was there, Guatemala, and I'm not sure if the, the others were there, but I'm sure they've been contacted. At some point, they need to take responsibility for what's happening to their countrymen. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming in. We've uh, reached the time on this segment. Thank you very much for having me. Joining us now in the studio is Lynn Marcus. She's the co-director of the Immigration Law Clinic at the University of Arizona Rogers College of Law. Thank you so much for coming in. You're welcome. Lots of legal questions surrounding these kids. We've heard earlier in the show that a lot of these children in their home countries were told now is the time to come up that they would get a free pass. So let's start with that simple but very complicated question. Do these kids get a free pass, so to speak, now that they're here? So there's no free pass. Children in immigration proceedings have basically four types of defenses that they can apply for. Um, one of them is political asylum. Um, they have to show that they have been persecuted or face persecution on account of one of specific reasons. Um, there's similar relief under the Convention Against Torture. The second one is special immigrant juvenile visa. They have to go into a juvenile court and show and get an order that they're dependent on a court and cannot be reunited with one or both family members because of abuse, abandonment, or neglect and that it would be in their best interest to remain. Um, the third one is for victims of human trafficking, severe forms of human trafficking, such as sex trafficking and labor trafficking. And the fourth kind is a special visa for victims of crimes in the United States who have suffered substantial harm as a result and can show a certificate from law enforcement or a court that they've been helpful in an investigation or a prosecution. Or a prosecution. That's it, though. It, even reunification with a family member doesn't get them any kind of legal status. It may get them released during the time that their case is pending, while other children may have to fight their entire case while detained. But ultimately, it doesn't lead to any kind of status. You've brought up so many options uh, for them that we need to delve into, but one of the things um, I noticed, and I'm sure some of our viewers have picked up on, you're talking about court proceedings. We all know from watching TV about, uh, you know, if you do, cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you. This does not necessarily apply to children. Our Miranda rights do not necessarily apply to these kids, correct? It's not criminal proceedings, and they're not, there's no statutory right to appointed counsel. Children for years in the immigration proceedings have been treated like miniature adults. There, was, there have been very few special procedures for them, and you will of this day see kids in immigration court whose feet don't even touch the ground in the witness chair being cross-examined by you know, you know, a trained United States trial attorney. So um, there have been programs that have arisen and great cooperation between the public and private sector. Many pro bono attorneys have been trained and stepped up to the bat. So there is representation of many unaccompanied minors, but more than half of them go unrepresented. And what about asylum? Uh, we know a lot of these kids were fleeing violence in their home countries. Does that qualify them for asylum um, if they were in gangs that they were fleeing or just general violence? Or is that a little harder to deal with? Asylum is a really complicated area of law. And the Board of Immigration Appeals have been interpreting it very restrictively. There's been a, a case that came down in 2008 and another one that came down in 2000. And this year that says that even if a child shows that he is he was beaten by gangs and had to flee for his life and will be killed by gangs if he goes back that's not enough to win political asylum so there there are first of all legal arguments that have to be made and will be fought in the courts that those restrictive interpretations are wrong but also there there are recommendations that there be a new standard for children that that you know, includes either the best interest of the child or at least recognizes that if children are going to be sent back to violence or harm, they should not be sent back. Let's talk about this spike, uh, if you will, in the number of unaccompanied children uh, trying to cross the border illegally. This has been a, a bit of a slow build. We've seen this coming, and there was, uh, as you and I were talking before this, a report a few months ago from the United Nations that talked about this. So that in some ways this should not have been a surprise. Well, it has. It, the numbers that were 6,000 to 8,000 for a number of years and then started to rise in 2011. But they doubled every year 
2012, and then this year are expected to triple to 60,000. So the it's we've seen it coming, but in terms of the how many children are coming, I think it has been somewhat of a surprise. Let's talk about um, how do you strike a balance between the legalities and the human response. Some of these kids are very young. Some are teens, late teens, 16, 17 years old. How do you strike a balance between they cross the border illegally and, and the human side of it? Uh, they may have family here. They may be uh, trying to escape violence. Well, the most important thing is to make sure that they're, um, well, that they're in safe and humane conditions, first of all, but for the long run, that they're having act, that they get access to their rights. Congress has created certain rights for them. Asylum is one of them, and many children do qualify under the ways the laws are interpreted, and special immigrant juvenile visas. But they need attorneys to help them navigate the system. You know, those four types of relief I mentioned to you, Three of them require either going into another court other than immigration court and asserting yourself to do that, or uh, or applying for it with a separate agency of Department of Homeland Security but with the U United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. So children can't navigate that system by themselves, and there should be one of the recommendations of a report recently by the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies and an organization called Kids in Need of Defense is that all unaccompanied minors be appointed counsel in these proceedings. And that's a fair balance to strike. Last week, the Obama administration set aside $2 million for more attorneys. Is that enough to deal with this current crisis, or do we need even more than that? I mean, it's a great step in the right direction. It's not enough to deal with the crisis. And, and there will need to be more an investment of, of resources. But it's a, it's a fair response to a humanitarian crisis. I mean, we don't want to make the mistake. This, you know, in, in World War II, there were Jewish refugees who came and, were, and could have been admitted to the United States. And we were so concerned at that time about quotas. And there was anti-Semitism as well that played into it. We don't want to make that mistake when we see children who are face, fleeing violence and facing the crisis. They need to be dealt with. with a multi -fa It's a multifaceted situation. It, there need to be a number of, of changes implemented to deal with the situation. Obviously a complicated situation on a humari humanitarian and a legal and uh, this, this won't be wrapped up by the end of the week. It's going to take a while. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and trying to uh, guide us a little bit through this complicated situation. You're welcome. And that's our program. Lorraine Rivera will be back next week. For the entire Arizona Week team, I'm Christopher Conover. Thanks for tuning in.